A firefighter is running through a burning apartment building. The air is thick with black smoke as burning debris crashes down around him. In the chaos, he's been split up from the rest of his crew. They've probably already exited the structure, and based on the conditions, he probably should too. But just as the firefighter turns to head back down the stairs, he hears something. There are cries coming from a room down the hall. The firefighter runs to the door. There's definitely someone inside. He can hear their voice as they cry for help. I'm coming, the firefighter yells. But when he tries to open the door, it won't budge. He backs up and throws his body against it, again and again and again until finally, the door bursts open. A wave of heat and smoke hits the firefighter, but he can see who is crying for help. There, across the room, hiding halfway under the bed, is a young girl. She's clutching a stuffed rabbit and crying with fear. The firefighter takes a step towards her, but he can feel the floor start to give way and has to step back. It will never support his weight. He'll need the girl to crawl to him. It's her only chance. He beckons for the girl to come to him as more flaming debris rains down. The little girl starts to crawl towards him, slowly at first, but then faster. She's almost to him when there's a loud crack. The fireman can only watch as the floor collapses beneath the little girl, and she falls. But suddenly, she stops. The fireman can't believe it. Her shirt has caught on a damaged pipe, and she hangs in the air as her stuffed rabbit is swallowed up in the flames below. The fireman reaches out for the little girl as she extends her hand towards his. They both stretch as far as they can, just a little further. They're almost touching, almost there. Just as their fingertips touch, the rest of the floor gives way, and they both fall. Outside, multiple crews man hoses and fight against the blaze, trying to contain the fire which is quickly getting out of control. There is a cry from one of the teams, and the men start running as a large portion of the building collapses. Was anyone still in there? Where's John? The fire chief asks anyone he can find, but no one has seen him. Just then, in the entrance of the building, a figure appears, silhouetted against the flames. It's John. He steps out of the burning building. His suit looks like it has been completely melted by the flames. Somehow, he's alive, but he's alone. As the other firefighters rush to help him, he looks like he is in a daze. They ask him what happened, if there's anyone else inside who might still be able to make it out, but he can only stare at them. A few weeks later, John is sitting in the firehouse. His fellow firefighters can still hardly believe that he made it out of that inferno unscathed. But while the fire miraculously didn't touch his body, it seems to have made an impression in other ways. He's once again at a table with numerous papers spread in front of him. One of the other firemen from his crew starts teasing him about working on one of his projects yet again. What is it this time? Is he doing his monthly budget again, checking credit card statements for fraudulent charges? John is working on his retirement plan, actually. That fire may have shown him that life can be cut quite short, but it also taught him that it's important to get your life in order so that the time you do spend on this earth is well spent. The fireman is laughing at John's newfound fiscal responsibility when the bell starts to chime. No more jokes, it's time to suit up and get out. The firefighters arrive at another large structure fire. A man rushing out of the building tells them between coughs that there's still people inside. The firemen don't hesitate and head into the building. They search the second floor and see a door with smoke billowing out from underneath it. John checks the door for heat and gives a thumbs up. They open the door and head inside. The smoke is so thick that neither of them can see much of anything. But then, through the smoke, they spot something. A woman is lying on the floor. They both step towards her when a beam comes crashing down from the ceiling. They both leap out of the way, and the fireman barely escapes being crushed. He stands up and asks if John is okay, but no response. He quickly looks around, but he can't see him. It's as if he just vanished. But there's no time to figure out what happened. He scoops up the woman, who coughs as he picks her up. She's still alive. As the fireman exits the building with the woman, she appears to have completely regained consciousness. The chief approaches them, but the fireman can only shake his head as if to say, John didn't make it this time. The woman who was rescued from the fire is in the hospital. The doctors can hardly believe it, but she tells them she's fine, and x-rays of her lungs show that there's nothing wrong at all. It's as if she hadn't just been carried out of a building where multiple civilians and firefighters were killed. The doctor tells her that they'll need to run a couple more tests, but if those come back clear, then he doesn't see any reason to hold her. As he is leaving her room, though, he stops and turns to her with one last thing. She has some visitors. The woman seems confused. As the doctor exits the room, 
a group of several people in dark black suits walk in. They look like FBI or CIA agents, but they don't have any badges. Good afternoon, ma'am. We're from the SCP Foundation. We've been looking for you. As the Foundation agents took this young woman into custody, researchers were already preparing a containment cell for her. Though once she got there, she would have a new name, SCP-069. This anomaly is a humanoid entity, though its exact appearance can vary dramatically thanks to its bizarre ability. Whenever SCP-069 is left alone with a recently deceased person's body, 069 will acquire its exact appearance. And not only will SCP-069 look like the recently expired individual, it will also take on their physical mannerisms, their voice, and even their patterns of speech, allowing it to look and sound exactly like the person who just passed away. In the same moment that it begins mirroring the person, the corpse will also disappear by a process that Foundation researchers have yet to understand. The body vanishes without a trace, leaving only the new SCP-069 instance alive and well in its place. This doppelganger will be virtually indistinguishable from the original, with even DNA and fingerprint tests coming back as a match for the original. Friends and family will have no idea that an anomalous entity has taken their place, since in addition to taking on all of the physical qualities of the deceased person, SCP-069 will also gain their knowledge and memories. They will act exactly as the person did, with only one single difference setting them apart. Those who are around SCP-069 in the days and weeks after its transformation will notice that the person will suddenly start expressing a strong desire to get their life in order, with that vague phrase relating to any number of potential tasks. These can include resolving outstanding obligations in their life, either personal like paying back an owed favor, or financial such as resolving debts or making long-term life plans like opening retirement accounts and updating their last will and testament. They will also often make efforts to visit with extended or estranged family members, rekindle friendships that have been allowed to languish, or other acts of closure, the kind that can build up over a lifetime and are often put off until it is too late. SCP-069 seems to retain no knowledge of its previous impersonations, and it will not carry any memories or abilities from one instance to another, outside of the one recurring desire to make things right in its new form's life. When an identified SCP-069 entity has been asked why it is engaging in this new behavior, it claims to have no ulterior motives besides an overwhelming desire to get their life straightened out since, after all, you never know when an unforeseen injury or death might occur. 069 itself experiences pain, injuries, and death just as a normal human does, but those similarities end at the exact moment they expire. When SCP-069 dies, its body will rapidly decay, turning to dust almost instantly. The Foundation has tried to preserve its body or at least stave off the rapid decomposition, but so far, all attempts have failed. After it has died, SCP-069 will then re-manifest at the site of the most recent human death, regardless of its proximity to where 069 died. There does not appear to be any distance limitation to this ability, and the largest such jump the Foundation has recorded is to a death that was 675 kilometers away from where its previous form died. This anomaly first came into the SCP Foundation's radar after field agents learned of a firefighter who appeared to miraculously survive an extremely deadly building fire, which claimed the lives of two other firefighters and 11 civilians. The firefighter had walked out of the building unscathed, despite his suit and equipment suffering an amount of damage that their wearer should not have been able to survive. Roughly three weeks later, the same firefighter responded to another large building fire. He was lost inside a smoky room, and was presumed to have died, despite his body never being recovered. A single civilian was rescued, and much like the firefighter, appeared unharmed, a virtual impossibility given the extremely smoky conditions from which she was saved. An SCP containment team, Mobile Task Force SHE-3, also known as the Body Snatchers, were sent to the hospital where she was recovering the next day, and SCP-069 was identified and taken into Foundation custody for the first time. Containment of this particular anomaly would prove to be quite tricky though, especially when its abilities were not fully understood. Several years after its initial capture, a guard assigned to SCP-069 cell was killed during a containment breach by another SCP, and the proximity of the guard's corpse to SCP-069 allowed them to take on their form. Though it was quickly discovered that the jump had taken place, and SCP-069 was returned to containment, they remained insistent that the Foundation was making a mistake and imprisoning one of their own. 
Over time, though, their protestations waned, and eventually, SCP-069 became relatively compliant and cooperative with staff. That is, until a huge mistake was made that would necessitate a drastic change to its containment procedures. A junior researcher who was assigned to 069 accidentally let slip that the agent's family had been informed of their untimely death. This seemed to greatly distress 069, and they reacted to the news by attempting to commit suicide. It's unknown what exactly triggered this response, since just being told that they were an imposter did not appear to have this effect in the past. But something about the family learning of the original person's death seems to have a profound impact on SCP-069. Following this event, SCP-069 has been placed on suicide watch, and plans to use other recently deceased SCP Foundation employees as possible targets for its ability have been suspended. SCP-069 continues to live in the form of its former guard, and is housed at Humanoid Containment Site 06-3. It continues to insist that it actually is the deceased agent, and still expresses a desire to get its life in order. Despite looking, sounding, and acting exactly as the former Foundation agent, it is not to be treated as if it is that person, no matter how tempting it may be for former friends and co-workers of the departed to have one last visit. If SCP-069 ever attempts to or is successful in breaching containment, it is to be subdued using non-lethal methods. Should SCP-069 die while in containment, Foundation agents are to closely monitor any reports of incidents where it appears that someone has somehow escaped certain death, a telltale sign that the person is now actually SCP-069. In the meantime, the Foundation will continue to study this strange anomaly, which has been classified as safe, and though we may never fully understand its abilities, perhaps there's something we can learn from it when it comes to second chances. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-3998, The Wicker Witch Lives, for another strange tale of an SCP that may not be exactly what it seems. And make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss a single anomaly as we delve further and further into the SCP Foundation's classified archives.